Well, thank you all for coming. Um, I'll have some more people trickling in, but since we only have less than an hour with Congressman Curbelo, I thought we'd get started, make sure we leave ample time for conversation with all of you as well. Um, my name is Jason Bordoff. I'm the uh, professor of professional practice at Columbia School of International Public Affairs, and I direct the Center on Global Energy Policy there. And really excited to have Congressman Curbelo uh, visit us uh, this evening and talk about a variety of issues and what's happening in our national politics in Washington, internationally as well, related to energy and uh, climate change. Let me just first say by way of um, housekeeping uh, items, this event is being webcast live. The full video will be available on the Center on Global Energy Policy's website in the coming days. For those in the room can participate and ask questions. Those watching online can ask questions as well uh, anytime on Twitter using the hashtag CGEP events and our Twitter handle at Columbia U Energy. Um, so thank you again uh, for joining us uh, tonight. And uh, our guest this evening is Carlos Curbelo. He is a distinguished visiting fellow at the Center on Global Energy Policy former representative of Florida's 26th Congressional District, uh, was the first Republican in something like a decade or more to introduce carbon pricing legislation in Congress. And we've had a few more come out and recently and, and support legislation along those lines, so we'll talk about that in a minute. We're gonna talk this evening about issues in energy and climate that are playing out in the news today from the presidential campaign and current bipartisan policy proposals in Congress, uh, also non also proposals that don't necessarily have bipartisan support. Also, how the political environment is evolving domestically and what's happening in the international uh, arena. Uh, we're gonna have a conversation uh, between Carlos and myself for the first 25, 30 minutes or so, and then open it up to questions from all of you. We have a microphone we will pass around. Um, so we're gonna talk a lot, we're gonna talk the whole time this evening about energy and climate, Carlos, but let me just start by asking, before we get to energy and climate, we're watching what's happening in our nation's capital from afar, including hearings today. Just talk a little bit about the atmosphere in Washington. Uh, obviously, the impeachment hearing, it seems like, is absorbing all the oxygen, making it difficult to get much else done in Capitol Hill, but maybe that's wrong. Uh, and just your perception of what's happening in our nation's capital today and what it means for our body politic and the ability of Congress to function. So uh, thank you, Jason. Thanks for this opportunity. Many thanks to everyone who's made the time to come out and join us tonight. And uh, thank you also for the great contributions that Columbia Center on Global Energy Policy is making um, to the country, to the world, in terms of informing, educating, and providing insights into energy policy, climate policy, energy markets, uh, really uh, everything uh, in, this, uh, in this fascinating and fast-changing realm. With regards to politics today in our country, it's a difficult time, it's a sad time. Uh, we have uh, been saying for quite some time that our politics are broken, uh, that uh, there's a lack of trust and confidence in our institutions of government, and uh, we're, we're seeing that, and exactly what that looks like uh, these days. Uh, we have a, a president who, um, goes out of bounds uh, quite often and uh, is being called out for it now. And uh, we'll see how this all unfolds. Uh, I think the, the hearings uh, have been uh, damaging to the president. I think, uh, I didn't get to watch today, but what I watched last week, uh, the witnesses were, were credible, uh, professionals, people who have dedicated um, significant part of their lives to serving our country and who have come across with great sobriety uh, and disinterest in the sense that uh, they're just sharing the facts as, as they know them, uh, no, uh, no other uh, underlying agenda. So uh, every member of the House will have to make a decision at the end of the process, and by the way, they should wait to make their decisions until they have heard from all the witnesses and, and can uh, analyze and, and, and weigh everything that, that's been presented. And uh, then it seems like uh, we'll be uh, observing uh, a, a fairly lengthy trial in the United States Senate uh, with, with a lot of witnesses and, and arguments. And anyway, um, I'll just leave you with this thought on this, and then we can talk about <laughs> things that are, that are more pleasant and exciting. 
But uh, what, what worries me most is uh, the, the diminishing of our institutions. And uh, my family um, had to leave Cuba in the 1960s. They were political refugees growing up. My dad, uh, who's, <coughs> who's still alive and doing well, thankfully, you know, would tell me the Americans, <laughs> the Americans do it differently. You know, politics in our countries uh, is nasty and divisive, and the adversary is actually the enemy. And my dad would say, in the United States, is different. People disagree respectfully. Uh, they never degrade each other. And um, sad for me to observe that that's not the case anymore, and that politics looks like a lot, a lot more um, like it, it happens in, in other countries where institutions are weaker and the political discourse is, um, is, uh, is unpleasant and undesirable. And that's the point we're at here, and I think every citizen has a role in fixing that and restoring our politics, and, and certainly um, uh, we have an opportunity to do that every day just in our own interactions with, with other Americans. So um, it, it is taking up all the attention, but there are some exciting things <laughs> happening in terms of climate and the environment. Uh, and uh, we can do this any way you'd yeah, like, Jason. So, but I mean, uh, you, well, you, you teed up the next, uh, the next question, which is, again, we've been really delighted and honored to have you as a distinguished visiting fellow at the center for the last year, helped to model uh, so the, the, the carbon pricing bill that you introduced, the carbon tax bill that you introduced in Congress. And I'm just wondering if you could share some thoughts about the evolution you've seen of the issue of climate especially in the House and especially in the GOP conference from the time you arrived to today. We had some comments from Leader MacArthur recently. We had now a Senate Climate Solutions Caucus talk about that. And how, how is that meaningful or is it just kind of window dressing? So let me share my perspective. <coughs> I, I got elected in 2014. The issue of climate change and the environment really chose me. So I, I being from South Florida, I, I cared about the environment, and I knew that I would dedicate a lot of time and energy to environmental policy, but I didn't think it would dominate my time in the Congress. It did. I, I easily spent more than half of my time and, and political capital in the Congress over four years working on climate change. And it's because uh, soon after getting elected, I had a meeting with NOAA scientists, I uh, got some pretty alarming um, reports about uh, where things were heading, what it meant for South Florida, the Florida Keys, which I represented. And I concluded that I, I needed to lead on this issue, not just be involved and be a positive force, but, but actually lead. So, uh, you know, a few weeks after that, I started uh, asking around uh, among House Republicans. There were 247 of us in 2015. It was the largest Republican majority since the Great Depression. And I was looking for allies, others who would work with me on this issue. I found out of 247, maybe four or five colleagues who would even put the words climate and change together, uh, much less uh, utter those two words in, in, a, in an audible voice. So I knew immediately, Jason, that, uh, that. Let me just ask you, was that publicly and, uh, or was that also privately? Like, is there much more consensus, but people are just not willing to talk about this issue as much publicly, or was that public? So, so yes, the, uh, the, the big obstacle is getting people to discuss the issue publicly. So denialism <coughs> is really not uh, a big thing among Republicans in Congress, believe it or not, most uh, fully understand the science and accept it and believe in, in sound environmental policies. Uh, they just uh, worry about getting primary challenges. They worry about uh, being accused of, of not being true conservatives. Uh, so it, it wasn't that uh, I would go up to people and they would say, oh, well, that's not true. and. Uh, um, this is just all natural, whatever, some of the things you hear from <coughs> denialists, most of them were like, oh no, yeah, that's important, but uh, I don't want to get involved in that issue. And, and, and we can talk more about that later, but there is a problem uh, with the alignment of incentives if you're a Republican or a conservative in Congress who wants to lead on the environment. You usually get attacked by the far left and the far right, so a lot of members just end up concluding this is not worth 
um, engaging in. But anyway, uh, so only four or five who are willing to, to lead publicly on the issue, to talk about it, to, to make it uh, a personal priority of theirs. So once I, uh, I came to the conclusion that, that we had a, a major problem in the Congress on this issue, uh, I teamed up with a Democrat from South Florida. His name is Ted Deutsch. He still serves in the Congress. And we formed the Bipartisan House Climate Solutions Caucus. And originally, this was designed uh, just to be a, a place where Republicans and Democrats could meet, have casual, constructive conversations about the issue, uh, just establish a healthy dialogue to, to try to break the polarization. So that started by the end of the 114th Congress, so the end of 2016. We had 10 Republicans and 10 Democrats in the caucus. Uh, we had the Noah's Ark rule, which was the best decision we made. You could not join the caucus unless you joined with a member uh, from the opposing party. So that triggered a lot of conversations within the Congress, Republicans and Democrats. Uh, in most cases, Democrats inviting Republicans to join. Uh, they would either, either talk to someone who was their friend or someone who um, perhaps they served on a committee with and, and had regular contact with. And that kind of started building trust and, and breaking <coughs> the ice on the issue. So we were thrilled. Ten Republicans, ten Democrats, healthy dialogue. We called in some witnesses, uh, just kind of uh, started getting a, a, a better understanding of the issue. The next Congress starts, 115th Congress, uh, uh, Trump had won the election, and we get this surge of Republicans, right? And after Trump uh, announces the intention to withdraw from the Paris Agreement and make some uh, irresponsible uh, comments about uh, climate change and climate science, uh, we get this surge of Republican. And the caucus swelled to 90 members uh, by the end of the last Congress, 45 Republicans, 45 Democrats. So again, going back to perspective, I told you that when I got to the Congress in 2015, there were maybe four or five Republicans who were willing to acknowledge climate change, uh, describe it as a priority. Uh, we took that from four to five to 45. And uh, it, was, it was no longer just a caucus where people would talk and have a, a dialogue and, and take witness testimony, but we actually organized and defeated uh, amendments on the floor of the House of Representatives the first time that under the Republican majority, amendments filed by Republicans that, that were not good for climate policy were defeated on the floor of the House. So that was another major milestone. OK, Republicans and Democrats have now organized in the House, and they have had an impact on the legislative process on the issue of climate change and the environment. So uh, I left the Congress involuntarily at, uh, uh, at the end of last year, or at the very beginning of this year. And, and uh, we had those 90 members. Uh, Democrats take over the House, the Green New Deal takes center stage and really uh, elevates the issue of climate change and the environment. So of course the Green New Deal is not a, a bill, it's not legislation, it's, it's a concept, right? Very broad, uh, uh, a, a series of aspirational goals, some of them not directly related to, to carbon emissions or, or climate and the environment. Uh, but the Green New Deal triggered a national debate and a conversation. And I think um, Democrats have behaved rather predictably. We knew that when they would take over the House, they would prioritize climate and the environment. They have. Uh, they have held hearings uh, in, in pretty much every uh, House committee, maybe except you know, the Ethics Committee and the Committee on Administration of the House. Uh, they have really elevated the issue, and, and we kind of expected that. But what we didn't expect, and I certainly didn't expe expect to this degree, is how Republicans have evolved and shifted and changed over the last 10 months. So Green New Deal, of course, uh, Republicans all raise their voices in opposition to it. And I tell people that that's, that's actually a good thing, because Republicans, we always need to be against something. And the <coughs> Green New Deal certainly checks that box for Republicans, but the conversation didn't end there. Republicans would get asked about the Green New Deal, and they would trash it, but then reporters would say, okay, what's your plan? 
And this is what, uh, where Republicans have really had to start thinking and what has pushed Republicans into a far better place uh, than we were in, certainly in 2015, and even at the end of the last Congress when we uh, got 45 Republicans on the record, uh, prioritizing climate change, uh, recognizing that the government has a role in addressing it. And what we've seen since then, Jason, I think is the real story that uh, some publications are covering, those that are, that are really hyper-focused on environmental policy, but I think the mainstream media is missing, and you can understand why there's so much going on, right, with impeachment and everything else, but we've had very prominent Republicans, like Greg Walden, who leads Republicans on the Energy and Commerce Committee, uh, state publicly that uh, this is a major priority for him and for his committee, and that Republicans have zero interest in questioning or challenging the science. Instead, they should be focused on solutions and debating solutions and offering their own solutions. Uh, we've had uh, Republicans from the Midwest, from the South, from all over the country, Texas, uh, now talking about uh, climate change and policy in a constructive way. Republicans have called witnesses to hearings They've invited their own witnesses uh, that are not climate deniers or those advocating against climate action, uh, but conservatives who recognize that uh, the government has a role in addressing climate change and are proffering certain solutions. Uh, Senator Lamar Alexander has proposed a Manhattan Project type initiative for the federal government to invest in research and development. Uh, for, for new technologies and, and products that could help us uh, mitigate uh, carbon pollution. You mentioned the, uh, the Senate uh, Climate Solutions Caucus. So explain, well, explain what yeah, that when is. I was in Congress, you know, I would describe this, the House Climate Solutions Caucus, which I co-founded with Ted Deutsch, we tried for a long time to get Senate Republicans to join Senate Democrats to create a similar entity, got zero traction. Guess what, just a few weeks ago, Senator Mike Braun of Indiana, a coal state by the way, uh, joined Senator Chris Coons of Delaware to launch the bipartisan Senate Climate Solutions Caucus. And uh, four Republicans have joined, uh, Lisa Murkowski, Mitt Romney, and, uh, and Marco Rubio of Florida, which was a, a wonderful um, development uh, from my perspective. And of course, uh, Senator Coons has gotten uh, Democrats to join as well, and they are also abiding by this you know, uh, symmetry rule. Uh, and uh, that's particularly interesting to me because the Senate is usually the place where bipartisan agreements get cut, and now there is an, an entity that uh, can, can be a home mm -hmm. to those, those conversations and those negotiations. And then lastly, before... Uh, I turn it over to you for the next question is, remember, 2015, House Republicans, no mention of climate change, ignore the issue, uh, it's not a priority, there's only risk involved in addressing it. Kevin McCarthy, leader of House Republicans, the minority leader in the House now, two weeks ago, comes out, says that Republicans need to lead on climate, that young voters care about the issue and that if Republicans don't pay attention to these young voters, uh, there will be peril for them in the future, and announces that House <coughs> Republicans are putting together a package of bills to address climate change, something that uh, would have been a shock uh, just uh, two or three years ago, and that probably would be a shock today if anyone was paying attention. And, and so why this shift? You said in the beginning you didn't find people to work with because they were either getting primaried, maybe it was because of corporate money and politics. I mean, there was something that was preventing this. Why, what, what's changed? So I can't just, I mean, you said like, you can't just be against the Grenada you, you, New Deal, you have to be for something, but it has right. to be more than just that, I think. So everything has shifted and House Republicans, I think their movement towards a more reasonable position should be analyzed or considered in the context of this broad shift we've had in our society and in our country. Um, major oil companies today are lobbying proactively and investing dollars in 
getting a price on carbon. ExxonMobil, ConocoPhillips, British Petroleum, Shell, all of these companies are not just saying that they're for carbon pricing, they're actually launching lobbying efforts and putting um, dollars in uh, political entities to advocate and drive uh, a campaign to get a price on carbon. Uh, the media are not covering climate change the way they used to, which uh, really the focus used to be on this debate and about and on whether or not the climate was actually changing and uh, whether or not the science was accurate. The media are now covering the real life effects of climate change. So they're covering tidal flooding, they're covering ocean acidification, they're covering the dying reefs in the Florida Keys and, and throughout the world. So uh, the public is becoming more educated. Uh, extreme weather events like these massive hurricanes that we've seen off the Florida coast in recent years. I tell people, be careful, don't say that we have hurricanes because of climate change, because of course Florida has been seeing hurricanes for hundreds of years, but certainly uh, the intensity and the size of these hurricanes uh, is extraordinary uh, of late. And, and, and of course, that's all fueled by warmer ocean temperatures. So uh, there's been this drastic shift in our society and the way we, we, we think about this, the way we cover it, uh, the way young people care about it, that I think in many ways, Republicans are reacting to that, and the political incentives are starting to align. They, it wasn't the case when I was there. You know, I, I led on this issue, and generally I got two types of calls in my office. Uh, Democrats or liberals saying that I was a phony and a fake and a fraud and just trying to greenwash, and conservative voters saying that I was a phony and a fake and a traitor and that I was just a, a, a liberal, uh, you know, disguised as a, as a Republican. So you can understand why members of Congress who are generally motivated by getting reelected uh, would want to stay away from the issue because th there's only pain and, and no uh, reward except, of course, for knowing you're doing the right thing, which is secondary to, to most people in Congress. But, um, but anyway, that's all starting to change. And as Kevin McCarthy said publicly, and he, I think he was, he was very honest about this, younger voters have zero tolerance for inaction on climate. And Republicans are starting to realize that. And you know, couple that with a lot of, believe it or not, thoughtful and, and, and sincere Republicans <coughs> who are starting to uh, really pay attention to the science, uh, pay attention to what's happening in places like South Florida and southern Louisiana and South Carolina, uh, and realizing that this is, this is real, this is not a, uh, that, and that there's nothing inherently progressive about caring about the environment and wanting um, future generations to enjoy a healthy planet. And when you, you know, that, that perception of phony or fraud, it's just pretend or whatever, that, that um, I, I suspect there's some, maybe some in this room, I don't know, who look at even some of the moves you've been talking about and, and, and have that skepticism, uh, and, and, uh, and I want you to address it, but, but part of it may also be because of what people see with this administration, and I, I don't mean to make this a partisan statement, although I worked for the prior administration, but I don't think this administration has thought progressively about the issue of climate change. So uh, given all these realities, you know, are people s justified in being skeptical of where some of the steps toward, toward greater potential action on climate change are headed that you talked about with some Republican colleagues Sure, in I mean, Congress. people should be skeptical generally when evaluating politicians, <laughs> uh, so it does not surprise me that people would be skeptical, maybe even cynical or pessimistic about Republicans and their uh, recent um, movements on, on, uh, on this topic, but I think given the president's rhetoric, given this administration's actions, it is even more remarkable that so many congressional Republicans are stepping out and saying, well, no, we, we do take this seriously, and we've ignored this issue for a long time, and that's been a mistake, <coughs> and we now have to engage constructively, and some actually are. And you have uh, everyone from you know, moderate Republicans, who we would expect to, to be more, um, 
open uh, to, uh, to engaging on this issue to extremely conservative Republicans. Some of you in this room may be familiar with the name of Matt Gates, uh, who is probably the president's most ardent defender in the House and recently stormed into the Intelligence uh, Committee, which I thought uh, was a mistake and, uh, and, and did some harm to the institution of the House. But uh, I will say on the issue of climate, and it shouldn't surprise us, I think Matt's 36 years old, he has called out Republicans. And he has said that the president's wrong and that Republicans have been negligent in failing to lead on this issue. And Matt has a, 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 a very quotable quote uh, when he says, I didn't come to Congress to argue with a thermometer. Uh, I think we need to get this right and we need to reduce emissions. And quite frankly, those of us who care about this issue who want to see a real progress made on this issue should welcome everyone, mm -hmm. should welcome everyone, <coughs> regardless of their views on other issues, we should welcome anyone who wants to make a contribution, who wants to help build that consensus that we need in Congress. So the way I see it is this way. For climate change, we need a global solution. If we're going to get a global solution, it means the United States must lead. We won't get a global solution without U.S. leadership. And if the United States is going to lead, we need some element of bipartisan consensus on this issue. It's very hard uh, in our government to move major pieces of legislation, to move major policy without some bipartisan <coughs> cooperation. And that doesn't mean we need to get all Republicans or even half a Republicans, but we, we do need some, and we're starting to see who those might be. I was going to ask how you talk, uh, or uh, what you find effective in talking to your colleagues on the Republican side of the aisle about the global nature of the problem. That's something I hear a lot from Republicans who acknowledge climate change is real and a serious risk, and, and, and one concern with strong action is that it will have a harmful effect on the U.S. economy, we can debate that, but, but that, but that most of the emissions are coming somewhere else and all the emissions growth is coming somewhere else and it doesn't matter if we act or not. So there's a, I hear, tell me if this is correct, I re, even from those who recognize climate change is, is, is a serious problem, you know, a reluctance to act because no one else is and it's not going to matter and just wondering what you find effective in talking to people who have that view. So I think probably the best argument against climate action, specifically carbon pricing or cap and trade, is that, well, uh, we can do it, but then you know, if the rest of the world doesn't follow, uh, it, it, it really kind of is an exercise in futility, right? Because um, if we go to zero emissions tomorrow and the rest of the world uh, remains at status quo, well, we've, we've achieved very little, maybe bought ourselves a little more time. but. Um, uh, you know, Republicans are right to be skeptical about these international agreements. And I would happily trade the Paris Agreement for uh, meaningful U.S. policy on climate change. In my view, that means probably a, a price on carbon with border adjustments. I would much rather uh, put in place a policy that compels the rest of the world to follow than one that trusts the rest of the world to follow. Take Kyoto, right? We didn't sign Kyoto, a number of other countries did, and yet we're the only country that, that met the, the targets of the Kyoto Protocol, correct me if I'm wrong. So uh, I would happily trade the Paris Agreement for uh, a price on carbon in the United States with a border adjustment component that will compel <coughs> at least all of the uh, leading economies in the world, China, uh, the, the European Union, um, India uh, to, to follow our lead and to price carbon or uh, to put in place clean energy standards, something, uh, a program that would uh, uh, be aimed at reducing emissions. And then one other, um, I call it skepticism or, or concern that would come up when you talk about the progress, more you know, bipartisan cooperation, recognition that climate change is, is a priority where that leads us and what, what, what does it really make possible in terms of real action? Uh, the view that if you really take the problem as seriously as, as it needs to be taken, we need to see pretty rapid change pretty quickly. And so does this take us to a point where the things we can agree on are some innovation agenda, some more funding for R&D, and yes, that's all good, but it's not up to the scale of the challenge. Is that where we are, or do, are you, do you think actually something bigger and bolder is possible? So I, I don't have a crystal ball, but I know some of the characters that, uh, that are involved in this process, and, and here's where I see this going today, and this, this could change 
uh, any day. But, but today I see Republicans becoming very comfortable with the idea of the federal government making a massive, uh, meaningful investment in research and development and new technologies uh, that will help us reduce uh, carbon emissions and also help us adapt for, for what's inevitable at this point. Uh, and I can see Democrats accepting that because, because I think Democrats would generally be very open to, to a, um, a, a national initiative um, and public investment in this space, but I see Democrats asking for a price on carbon, probably a modest price on carbon at first, uh, to fund this program, to make it uh, budget neutral. Uh, so that's where I see uh, this, uh, uh, the, these currents uh, pushing Republicans and Democrats toward right now. Will it be easy? No. Uh, but going back to carbon pricing, people ask me, do you really think we can get Republicans to embrace a tax on carbon pollution? And the answer is probably no, but we don't need them to embrace it. We just need them to accept it as part of a broader compromise. And by the way, there are infinite opportunities to satisfy priorities um, uh, of members in both parties in this type of negotiation. A price on carbon uh, can yield uh, or will yield uh, significant revenues, at least a trillion dollars over 10 years. And those funds can be invested in a number of different things from agriculture to infrastructure. Uh, and that could be very helpful in building the types of coalitions you need in Congress to get major pieces of legislation passed. I want to open it up. I just ask you one question, and maybe we can bring a microphone around uh, so people can put their hand up if they if they want the microphone brought to them uh, while I'm asking this question. Um, uh, you talked about sort of where some of the oil majors have been in terms of support for CLC, the Climate Leadership Council, for carbon pricing. Um, <clears throat> the business community more broadly, uh, Chamber of Commerce has been more vocal about climate change recently, including the Paris Agreement. What do you see happening in the business community right now, and how important is that for the potential for more Republicans to feel comfortable uh, engaging on the climate issue. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're witnessing history. Right? And again, I, I know a lot of, for a lot of people it's hard to get optimistic because um, you know, our politics have disappointed us on this issue, specifically uh, Republicans. And by the way, you know, a lot of people were disappointed by Senate Democrats in 2009 and 10 when they, they refused to, to uh, take up any uh, meaningful uh, climate solution. But we're witnessing history. I mean, the, the, we have oil companies lobbying for a price on carbon. We have the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, which supported uh, the president's decision to withdraw from Paris in 2017, reversing itself and, and essentially saying, we were wrong, the president's wrong, we support remaining in the Paris Agreement. Um, you have the Chamber of Commerce inviting Sheldon Whitehouse, who's one of the leading Democrats in this space, uh, to, to give a keynote address to their, uh, their, their biggest members. Uh, this is all changing very quickly, and, and every factor influencing the debate on climate policy in our country right now is pushing in the, in the right direction. Uh, the, the White House being an obvious outlier, but even the White House is understanding and reacting to the politics of this. The president, I think, said the other day that he deeply cares about uh, climate change and the environment. Now, of course, that's belied by, by a lot of the policies, but even if people are saying the right things and they don't mean it, it's still a positive development because it shows which way the trend is going. And a lot of people ask me, oh, but what what do you think is the motivation? I don't care. I just want people to do the right thing. Why they choose to do the right thing is, is, is irrelevant to me because it's impossible to ascertain why anyone's doing what they're doing anyway unless you know them really well. So um, it's, a, it's a good time. Uh, we should all celebrate the progress that's been made and of course do everything we can to accelerate that progress so that we can get to this meaningful solution as soon as possible, and so that my daughters don't have to move out of Miami in 30 years. 
Are there questions uh, in the audience? Ma many questions, excellent. So uh, there's maybe work your way up. There's one gentleman there, and we'll come up here next. And if folks could please identify yourself and please keep the question brief for Congressman Curbella. Okay. Uh, I'm Mark Roush. Uh, I work for the Environmental Defense Fund. I'm a clean energy specialist there. Um, Congressman, first of all, I want to thank you for your leadership, especially when it was a very lonely place to be uh, a few years ago. Um, and I, I accept that many House and Senate Republicans now are starting to have bigger ideas and better ideas about climate. Meanwhile, there's a systematic dismantling of regulation uh, affecting climate going on, and the Sabin Center at Columbia Law School has been tracking that uh, online and sending out bulletins ever since January 2016. Is there any uh, avenue in the House or, or Senate, uh, any mechanism, any route, uh, other than perhaps through appropriation bills, to put the brakes on that? And because it, it's going to take a while, even if there's a change in 2020, to undo all the undoing that's <coughs> been done, and meanwhile, a lot of damage is being done. Thank you. Maybe you can bring the microphone to the front while Congressman Cabello is answering. So regrettably, I don't think you're going to see uh, Congress uh, reach any kind of agreement that, that would uh, pose an obstacle to, to all of this irresponsible deregulation. By the way, I support some deregulation, uh, but uh, certainly not uh, what the administration is doing. What I will tell you is that despite um, everything you just mentioned, Republicans and Democrats in Congress have worked together to deliver record funding for environmental programs, uh, which is something that we wouldn't expect under this administration. So I think they're doing what they can. Uh, but the good news also is that all of these regulatory changes, and we know because uh, you know, President Obama did put in place a number of regulations, and we're seeing today how easily those can be reversed. Well. Uh, these changes, I suspect, will be reversed at some point or perhaps replaced by law, uh, which would be even better. Uh, so uh, that's why I would put um, my focus and emphasis on the Congress, because what we need in this country is not um, better regulation that would help, but clearly it's, 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 uh, it's unreliable and not durable. What we need is a change in law. Uh, to set us up for the next uh, 50 years, and that will only happen through the Congress. It actually hasn't been as easy. The administration's lost in court. Well, yeah, many, right. Many e even and then, it, it, it does yeah. take some time, but, um, you know, executive orders. But the difference between the durability of Congress, congressional action versus yeah. executive action is the point you're making. Yeah. So there's a comment here, and then we'll go over there. And, yeah, just identify yourself. Keep it brief, please. My name is Omar Gutierrez Arenas. I also appreciate your activity in favor of the environment in the, in the Congress. And I would like to know uh, if this rule uh, for enforcing symmetry in the Climate Solution Caucus in the Congress uh, has been changed recently, and if that is the case, why? So in the House Climate Solutions Caucus, the rule didn't change. Uh, what changed was the composition of the Congress. So a lot of the Republicans who uh, were in the caucus, including its co-founder, were defeated. Uh, so, so there, there was a, a, uh, a, a lack of <coughs> equilibrium after the election, and it's, it's taken some time to try to uh, even it out again. But, uh, but yes, it, the, the rule is still in place. Uh, what happened was that it, that was disrupted by the election. And over here, and then we'll go down the aisle. There's two over here, and then we'll go over here. Uh, my name is Gopal Sundaraman, and I appreciate all your efforts and bring a fresh voice in, uh, for, to this clim climate issue. Uh, my question is on the carbon pricing bills. There are two to three bills that are in uh, that have been issued uh, in the House of Representatives. If you think about the bill that's, uh, that Exxon and all the corporations are supporting, the bill wants to revoke all the EPA uh, regulations that's, that's already currently present, at least for the next 10 years. And uh, some of the research that Columbia did says the, even if the bill is introduced, it's not going to reduce emissions maybe by 5%, 10% by 2030. But there are other bills, like the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, would reduce it by up to 40 or 50 percent. So even though you, so what are your thoughts on bringing a climate, like a carbon pricing bill, and how how you think can it can be effective in reducing emissions? Now there could be corporations who come in and they, they could 
revoke all the EPA <coughs> mandated emission emission controls that have already been put by some of the administrations. And if you if that's been revoked, how would these bills be effective going forward? So I think um, that a price, a meaningful price on carbon, which probably means anything over $20 per metric ton, would have a significant effect uh, on emissions and would do so very efficiently, whereas regulations are, um, you know, can be avoided. It's very difficult to avoid a price on carbon. It, it, it's almost impossible if it's implemented properly. Uh, what I would say is that there should be an overall cap on emissions. So what I did in, um, in the legislation that, that we put together, and we spent a year building this legislation, is we had a rolling moratorium of EPA regulation uh, over um, stationary sources of emissions, so essentially um, um, power plants. Uh, and what, what the bill did was the moratorium uh, was in place as long as we were meeting our emissions reductions goals. If the emissions reductions goals weren't being met, then the EPA was automatically authorized to regulate again. So <coughs> as long as you have an overall cap, uh, I, think, I think it does make sense to suspend regulation because uh, the pricing, uh, in theory, should have a, 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 um, a better effect than, than you would get from regulation. And, and the good thing is you can measure that, right? We, can, we measure our emissions every year. So I would say uh, any legislation needs to have a cap and uh, then the deregulation can depend <coughs> on whether uh, we're staying under the cap on emissions. It's a, an important point, and, and I should say we have a major carbon tax research initiative that Congressman Cabello has been involved with, looking at all these and design benefited and benefited from <laughs> while I was in Congress. <laughs> these design and implementation issues, and, and the point you're raising, any sort of political deal would likely see some camps ask for regulation to be lifted, uh, and, and, uh, and in exchange, people say you need an environmental assurance mechanism of the sort Carlos was talking about. If we're hitting our environmental goals, okay, but we, need, we can't lose this as a backstop if we don't. Um, yeah. Uh, my name's Hunter McDonald. Thanks so much for coming to speak today. Um, I wanted to ask in the context of thinking back to the Obama administration lifting the ban on crude exports and the geopolitical and economic dividends that shale oil and crude oil exports for the U.S. Have, have yielded. How do you rate the political 180 that seems to be taking place among the Democratic presidential front runners now talking about banning fracking, ban, uh, reimposing the ban on crude exports? Um, does this strike you as more just uh, sort of primary posturing? Um, is it at all practical um, thinking about sort of uh, prices at the pump being a perennial political lightning rod. Um, how are the Democrats really you know, thinking about this issue? Now you can opine on the other side of the aisle. Yeah, it's a little easier. <laughs> um, the problem with, with primaries is that candidates are addressing about 10% of the population. So it, it, it's, it, it's a horrible system. Uh, I'm actually part of an effort in Florida now to open up primaries to independent, well, just open them up uh, entirely because uh, clearly the current system is deeply flawed. So, um, you know, Democrats have to be very careful about putting themselves in a box. Something that, that we did in our legislation is that we impose a price on carbon, but we actually repeal the gas tax. And here's why. Uh, Americans are obsessed with gasoline prices. Maybe not here in New York City, because the <laughs> subway's packed, but uh, where I live, which is not a rural area at all, uh, and especially in, in rural and suburban America, this, this is like, you know, there's a spike in gas prices. It leads the local news, it leads the national news, it's in the front page of, of the newspaper. Uh, so, in theory, is you know, Democrats, oh yeah, we're going to you know double gas prices. That that is that's a political <coughs> loser. Okay, I I don't care, um, you know, uh, how much the country has evolved on this issue. 
No one wants to pay more uh, at the gas pump, especially not because some politician decided that they should. So, uh, you know, th this is primary talk, and, and I think reality will set in very quickly once the general election uh, comes around. Whoever the Democratic nominee is not going to be on stage saying, yeah, we're going to double gas prices and force people out of their cars. They're just not going to say that because they'll probably lose if they say that, and, and they desperately want to win, probably more than at any time uh, during my lifetime. So, uh, you know, this idea of uh, imposing a, a crude oil export ban, wh what does that solve? What does that solve? I, I voted, and, uh, and with a lot of Republicans and Democrats in the House, I actually presided over the vote that uh, lifted the crude oil export ban, and that was a bipartisan compromise, and, and, and a lot of Democrats concluded, yeah, who cares? If, if, if the world is going to consume oil anyway, it might as well be our oil instead of Venezuela's oil or, or, or Saudi Arabia's oil. So um, uh, I, I don't know what, you know, Jason, if you want to weigh in a little bit on this, but I don't think um, a lot of these proposals that we're hearing now in primary season are going to have much legs come uh, the fall of 2020, much less uh, if, if a Democrat does win the White House and, and has to govern. Yeah, well, there's obviously the sort of primary versus general election politics changes. That's true. The point you made about how it's it's uh, it, it's hard to to de harder you think to deregulate. You lose in court. Sometimes it's harder to regulate. So if you actually wanted to restrict oil and gas production in the U.S. Uh, without Congress, just the president alone, that's actually harder to do than people think in terms of what authority you have to actually do that on public versus private uh, lands. Um, so that's sort of a, that's a piece of it um, as well. Um, there was, but I did want to ask you, because you sort of said the politics of this is such that, you know, you're, you just could never do that because it's going to increase energy prices, no one's going to increase energy prices. You, you support carbon tax. Mm -hmm. So that increases energy prices. Yeah. So um, why do the same concerns not apply that you said sort of would make it impossible for people to think about restricting oil production? Well, I, well, a couple of things. Number one, any carbon pricing bill would have a dividend component for uh, at least uh, lower income households. In, in our bill, it was for the, the lowest quintile in income. Uh, you could probably do more, and, and you probably should do more than that. Uh, so, so those that are most sensitive to energy price increases would be protected and would probably actually be better off uh, than they are today. Uh, but also, in, in, you know, when it comes to electrification, I think uh, we, can, we can move um, with a lot more agility than um, the transportation mm -hmm. sector. Uh, it's very hard, especially for lower income people. Well, hey, just buy a more fuel efficient car. Well, that, that's, that's, not, that's not easy for a lot of people. But we can put pressure, and, and already major US utilities are reacting to consumer demand for cleaner energy. Next Era, which services us in South Florida, uh, is the, the biggest developer in the world of renewable energy. They're, they're building uh, solar power plants, uh, they have nuclear. Uh, they're investing in wind, they're retiring uh, oil and, and coal plants. So th th that transition has already begun and we would just uh, accelerate it. And look, I, um, I'm, I'm not saying that any carbon pricing bill must um, uh, so cancel the, the, the gasoline tax, but at the end of the day, there's a political component to this. This is not an academic <laughs> exercise or an economic exercise. It's fundamentally a political exercise. And uh, raising gas prices drastically uh, is, is a political loser. The other thing we did in our bill was we repealed the jet fuel excise tax mm -hmm. because I, I didn't want anyone who gets on a plane to, to, to be opposed to this bill. And I didn't want airlines to uh, tell all their customers that it was going to be impossible for them to fly. So uh, when you're crafting policy, you have to um, really consider politics, uh, <laughs> whether you like it or not. And um, in terms of gas prices, that's probably uh, the, um, the biggest red flag when it comes to pricing carbon. I, w I should just add quickly, because you said, obviously, just what you said a minute ago, there is obviously a difference between primary and general election politics, but I don't want to dismiss the question. The landscape 
of what's sort of in the fairway when it comes to restricting production has shifted. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that under the administration that I worked in, that was sort of support oil and gas production, it's good for the economy, certain things go too far, pipeline to oil sands, maybe drilling in the Arctic, that question of what goes too far has shifted. And so right. you know, the Obama administration put a moratorium on coal leasing on federal lands. The idea that you might have a moratorium on oil and gas leasing on federal lands, that's pretty in yeah, mainstream real policy now. And, yeah, and it's yeah. not just Senator Warren, it's Vice President Biden whose plan calls for, for that. So it, there has been a shift in, this, in, the, in where that thinking is. Um, I think someone's holding a microphone here and then you've had your uh, gentleman uh, in the suit on the aisle has had his uh, hand up for a while. Hi, thank you. My name is Ariana. Um, I was curious because you said that you know people are going to to join in on this issue from from both sides, regardless of how they feel about the other issues. And what I'm thinking is that once the funding comes in, once people are on the same page, that they're going to be elbowing each other, um, and uh, that's going to sandbag any momentum that the movement has had um, because of general disagreements and fundamental disagreements about how the economy should work, about where the labor is going to go, about you know what kind of services people are going to get out of it. So I'm wondering where you see that conversation going. And like to be honest with you, it's it's really difficult for people to um, to confront the situation and know that we have like 2050 is a very generous estimation. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. Look. Uh, uh, I'm not saying that uh, this is going to be easy going forward. Uh, what I'm saying is that we are actually having a debate and a discussion right now. And once both sides want something, which is increasingly the case, I mean, Democrats have, have you know, a host of ideas and demands when it comes to climate policy. Now Republicans are starting to say, well, we want this and that. Now, now there's potential. Uh, when one side is saying we want A, B, and C, and the other side is saying, well, we don't want anything, so so we're not. We're, you know, wh what are we going to sit down and talk about? Uh, that's that's what it's been like for the last 20 plus years. That has now changed, and you have Republicans bringing proposals forward, saying we want to show voters that we're serious about this. And these are the ideas that, that we um, are, are going to unite around or push for. Now, now you have <coughs> potential energy, right? And you can, you can actually get somewhere. Now, it's going to be rocky. Uh, but uh, I think that within the next two to five years, the uh, public opinion in our country is really going to force uh, a compromise. And, Despite uh, all of the uh, disagreements and the, the tribalized nature of our politics, big compromises are possible. We had major criminal justice reform at the end of the last Congress, the First Step Act. That didn't happen overnight. That didn't happen just in the last Congress. Uh, there have been people working on both sides uh, to try to get Republicans and Democrats to a place where they could agree. On the Republican side, I can tell you that um, uh, organizations that advocate for fiscal responsibility, like you know, Coke Industries, uh, became a major supporter of criminal justice reform. Uh, evangelicals uh, became major supporters of criminal justice reform, and 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 that's how Republicans were pushed to a place where they could uh, reach a compromise with Democrats. For uh, on the Democratic side, it wasn't that easy either because. <coughs> You know, the progressive party in any country always wants more and more, and, and sometimes they hold out for less or for nothing. So uh, it, was, um, it was a legislative miracle uh, because th this is so rare these days, but it is possible. And we're starting to see those same um, types of uh, entities weighing in. We have on the Republican side the Evangelical Environmental Network uh, <coughs> trying to sell climate change from a a, a Christian, a religious perspective. We have small business groups. We have veterans groups. Th this, this is, a lot of people don't see uh, everything that happens, right? The many little steps that get taken on the way to, to major legislation um, passing Congress and becoming law. But I can see that very clearly today, and that gives me a lot of hope. That, does, that doesn't mean that it's going to happen tomorrow, and it doesn't mean it's going to be easy.
No, we're just about out of time, but you've been waiting patiently. Please, a quick final question. Maybe we could pick one if you don't mind. Um, the tax system was designed years ago to encourage mineral <coughs> companies to bring in oil, gas, and coal and depreciate them. That long, that became a long depend, long-term dependable source of economic incentive. You chose instead for the renewable energy industry to give the production thing that expired and tax thing that expired, nothing you can count on long term that you can build on or depend on. Why don't you just put renewable energy into the solar depletion allowance realm and have it tied exactly to the same thing that other depletion allowances are and let it live there forever? That would, that would be fair and I certainly wouldn't oppose that. What I would prefer though is a price on carbon uh, accompanied by the, the, the <coughs> removal of all um, special benefits or uh, special tax treatment under the code because it would achieve the same thing. Obviously, uh, those, those fuels that are higher emitting would, would be at a disadvantage and, and renewables would, would be at an advantage. So you wouldn't really need these incentives unless you wanted to accelerate the transition even more, which you could, but uh, some might argue that that's uh, not um, you know, philosophically consistent. Sure. I, sure. I, equitable treatment. Yeah. Uh, thank you all uh, for joining us. Thank you, uh, Carlos. As I mentioned, the full video recording of this event will be available on our website in a few days. This is just one of many great events we have uh, coming up. We mentioned our carbon tax research initiative. We also have a carbon management research initiative where we look at carbon capture utilization, direct air capture, carbon removal technologies. And as optimistic as I am about the trends you talked about in DC, I we might want to. We might want to have tools like that at yeah, our disposal, just in case. Just in case <laughs> we don't actually meet uh, what it would look like to come at really anywhere close to well below two degrees. And so we'll be talking about that uh, Friday, November twenty second. Uh, that's our next event at ten a.m. at uh, Faculty House on campus with Dr. David Keith from Harvard University, known to uh, many people in the climate world, uh, along with our own uh, Julio Friedman, who leads our carbon management research initiative. They'll be talking. A, um, David will be giving a, a really fantastic talk, I've seen him give before, Inventing the Future, Zero Carbon Fuels and Climate Restoration. So I hope you'll join us for that. Please join me in thanking Congressman Carlos Corbello.